Good stuff. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. And are you ready to hear from the book of Luke? Grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. Turn to the book of Luke. It's in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I want to ask you a question. Can you have a healthy division of people? Like, could there be a a time where it's good that people are divided and not unified and not all doing the same thing? Scott, that's kind of a deep question. (laughs) I didn't know I was going to be so stirred up today. Let me just say it a different way then. In fact, look at this picture on the screen, would you? Look at this picture. Have have you ever... (laughs) Okay, someone got it. It's a sore thumb. Have you ever seen someone, something, have you ever experienced a time when you stuck out like a sore thumb? Think about that. Is there a time when it's good to stick out like a sore thumb? Is there a time when it's like, man, it's good that you look different and you're sticking out over all the others? Now, inherently, truth be told, most of us would what? We'd rather just fit in, right? Most of us would like, don't bring attention to me. Don't make everyone look at me, right? But is there a time where it's good that we would look a little different? I remember one time when I was a kid. In fact, go with me for a second, will you? I'm going like a long time ago. I'm talking the 80s. 1985. Go to 1985, the Elkhart County 4-H Fair. We're there, and I'm just like, what, a fifth grader, fourth grade, fifth grader? And uh, I was there with my dad, hanging around. My dad was doing some work um, at the fair. And and, and so there was, uh, and I remember my sister Julie was with us. And Jackie, my sister, uh, who's the middle child, if you're watching right now, I love you, Jackie. You you gotta say things like that when you're getting ready to tell an embarrassing story about your sisters. But here's the deal. Um, uh, Jackie was in that middle school uh, age, young lady. um, And I don't know if you've ever uh, had a middle school young lady in your house. I'm not picking on any young lady, but I'm just telling you, it's, just, it's an emotional upheaval time here. And, and so Jackie was out and about at the fair with her friends and some other friends from school or whatever. And, and, um, and I, I just remember, this is, this is the main thing I remember, is that it was time uh, for us to go or something like that. And so a dad, my dad pulled a real dad move. I mean, <clears throat> I, I, would, I would have done the same thing. Why not? Your child, you want to talk to him. What do you do? Well, you go to the, the, the person who has the microphone thing and that like, like <clears throat> you see where I'm going. Blasts all across the whole county fair. Jackie Miller, please meet your dad at gate one. Please meet your father at gate. Jackie Miller, <laughs> please meet your father. And I'm a fifth grade boy. I, 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 I was just, I didn't understand what the big deal was until I saw Jackie coming about to explode with anger and embarrassment. And, I, you know, it was the 80s. I'm sure she said something like, I am so sure. Uh, if you live to the 80s, you know why I said that. But she was like, I can't believe you just did that. All of my friends heard my name. There were boys standing there that heard my name and just had a complete middle school breakdown right there. Why? Because she just wanted to fit in. Don't call me out. I want to just fit. It's inherent in all of us. It's just this kind of the natural thing for most of us. We just want to, we just fit in. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to be singled out. Um, I want to fit in. Um, The problem with that is clear, though, when it comes to faith. The problem with that is clear that, that because our Christian faith, well, it calls you to stick out. We ought to stick out. People ought to see a difference in the way I treat my wife and the way I raise my girls and the way I live my life. They ought to see a difference in my integrity. They ought to see a difference in your integrity. They ought to see a difference in, our, in, in, in the way we live. There ought to be a difference. In fact, God's word says we're set apart. We are holy people. And there ought, that ought to be exemplified. You say, why are you talking about this, God? Because that's really where Jesus is going in our text today. 
He's like, they, I, I, in fact, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Jesus himself, though, was stuck out like a sore thumb. Am I right? I mean, just read the Gospels. He was different. And people didn't like him for it. You remember that? How about the whole time when they tried to push him off the edge of the cliff and he was like, go, go, gadget, cloak. <laughs> and he was just like, Whoa, and he slipped away. We don't know how. What about the, uh, the over and over and over again before they finally did arrest him? They were trying over and over and over again to try to figure out a way to arrest Jesus so that they could put him on trial and crucify him, right? What they eventually did. Jesus stuck out like a sore thumb. I just want to encourage you with a word here. God wants you to stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Well, let's just get into the text here. Uh, Luke chapter 12. Are you there yet? Luke chapter 12. We're going to go verse, um, yeah, verse 49. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is complete. Verse 51 do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. Whoa. Heavy. Let's talk about that, division. In fact, verse 49 first says he came to bring fire. Fire. Fire is not a new thought in Scripture, right? We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. Um, John the Baptist uh, declared that he's going to baptize you. Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Here in this context, you read uh, uh, um, several commentaries. Hear different people preach on this. You might hear three or four different things of, what is Jesus saying? I, I Specifically, he says, I have come to bring fire. What, what is he saying there? Well, let me just real quick just hit a couple of thoughts of what, what this could be. It could be several things. But perhaps the fire here stands for God's judgment on those who are unrepentant. I mean, that really what it, that's what it could be. Jesus said, I wish that it were already here. I mean, I've come to judge. We've come to judge. There's going to be a time of holding people accountable for their sins. I, I wish it, it was already here. Um, or else it could be this. It could be the idea of purifying. Uh, how I wish this purifying, sanctifying presence of the Holy Spirit was already inside of you. Can I just remind you, in the Old Testament believers, the Holy Spirit didn't come and dwell in them. But you, as New Testament believers, since Jesus Christ died and rose again, the Holy Spirit then came in a, in, in a different form. He's always been here, but in a different form. He came, and the moment you gave your life to Christ, what happened? The Holy Spirit flame lit inside of you. We're saved. The Holy Spirit's inside of us. In fact, if, you, if the Holy Spirit's not inside of you, there's no way you can be saved. So, I mean, that just doctrinally, that's, that's just a thing. And so Jesus is saying, oh, I wish the Holy Spirit's presence was in you, sanctifying you, making you holy, purifying you. In fact, um, this is what Jeremiah 31 talks about. The time is coming uh, where I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Ezekiel prophesied this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to my laws. Perhaps Jesus was saying, oh, I wish the fire was already here. The fire that's living inside of you. Remember, Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't necessarily reside in people, Right? New Testament believers like you and I, I mean, we, we would put ourselves in that. The Holy Spirit resides in us. And Jesus, maybe he's saying, I just wish the, the purifying, sanctifying presence of the Holy Spirit was already here doing this. That's the second. The third thing that I toss out to you is maybe it's just an, uh, uh, just, maybe it is an empowering word. I mean, um, when, when I think about empowering, the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I, I wish, I, I've come to bring fire on the earth. I've come so that you can be empowered. Um, what Isaiah 44, 3, look on the screen. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Joel chapter 2. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men are going to dream dreams. Your young men are going to see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Maybe Jesus is saying, Oh, I wish the fire of God in that way was here right now. 
okay. Which one of those is it? Maybe all three, maybe one. I'll let you decide. But it could be any of those. But the fact of the matter is Jesus is saying, I wish it was already here. I wish that fire was here. Look at verse 50. He says, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it's complete. Let's stop for a second. Um, Jesus has already been water baptized. You, what he's talking about is his death, right? His death, burial, and resurrection. He's got to go through that. But, he's saying, um, but I have a baptism. But before the Holy Spirit can come down, I've got to accomplish what God the Father has for me to accomplish here on earth. I've got to go through this baptism, this death, burial, and resurrection. I've got to go through this. And then the fire's going to come. Look out. The fire's going to come, but I've got to go through what I got to go through here. And now look at verse 51. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. No. I tell you, but I've come to bring division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. Look at verse 53. They'll be divided. Father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. mother Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Wow. That's a lot of conflict. Jesus isn't declaring the inevitable. If you're like, oh, yeah, I lived that one out with my in-laws. Uh, no. I, I've got a great relationship with my in-laws. So, um, but um, just think about Luke chapter 12, verse 51. But look at the message translation of this on the screen. Look at this. Do you think I came to smooth things over and make everything nice? Not so. I've come to disrupt, and I've come to confront Jesus came to divide. He came, he, he, Jesus came uh, uh, to, to bring division of those who are on fire, living for him, and those who aren't. I mean, when we're devoted to Jesus, we're, we're going to be opposed. And as we're devoted to a lifestyle that honors Jesus, some are opposed to our lifestyle that honors Jesus. And we're not to be rude, we're not to be mean, we're not to be self-serving or haughty or proud or religious, but we ought to know and be ready for the fact that some people aren't going to like the fact that you love Jesus and you serve Jesus. Just by your uh, commitment to follow Christ, there is division that's going to come in your life. There are some people that just aren't going to like you. There's going to be even, Jesus is just using as an example, even within your family. I mean, how many of you... How many of you, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have a lot of my family who serves Christ. But how many of you in your families, do you have some division? Why? Because some of you are serving Christ and some of you aren't. And, and maybe you go to Thanksgiving meals and, and Christmas meals and you're just like, this is going to be interesting. Not just because of crazy Uncle John, but because uh, you're, at some point faith is going to come up or whatever. Or maybe you don't ever say a word and they just get mad at you. You don't even say a word about faith, a word about Jesus, a word about church. You don't say anything like that. And you go through the whole thing and someone at the very end says, I just, I can't stand being around you anymore. You're like, what did I say? And you're like, you didn't say anything. It just, I just knew it was, I knew what you were thinking. I mean, maybe, why? Jesus says, I've come and, and when I, I've come to bring division. There's gonna be division. In fact, um, let's just take this a little further. You see it in your family. You see it in in your coworkers or whatever. But can we think of just just think of just one or two or just a handful of things that man? These are hot button issues that you just bottom line. Someone who doesn't follow Christ and you are, you're gonna you're gonna be divided on this, and it's okay. One of those that I would say is is found in um, John chapter 14. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screen. But last week I was using a passage from John's gospel where Jesus was talking about how he was going to prepare a place for us in eternity, which is heaven, right? And he's talking to Thomas. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The apostles repeated this in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So what's the point? There's only one way of salvation, only one way to get to God, and that means this. All other religions are wrong. Go to work tomorrow and just raise that one. 
Go to school tomorrow and just say, I just want you to know. But inherent in faith, in Christianity, that's really what Christianity is straightforward in saying. There, there are not many ways to get to God. There's only one way. And that's through Jesus Christ and through the cross. He's the way, the truth, the life. The only way to get to the Father. The only way to be saved. And we, we understand that. There's only one way. Jesus is only uh, the only way to heaven for several reasons. Let me just say it real quick. Jesus was chosen by God to be the Savior. We see this in Scripture. Jesus is the only one to have come down from heaven and returned there. He's the only person to have lived a perfect human life. He's the only sacrifice for sin. He alone fulfilled the law and the prophets. He is the only man to have conquered death. He is the only mediator between God and man. He's the only man whom God has exalted to the highest place that's our savior jesus is the only way when you take a stand like that there's going to be division and it's a good division and we need to take a stand there are things biblical absolutes that we cannot just roll over and just say well all right guess it's not that big of it no it is a big deal now i'm not saying we got to be dipsticks about it I'm not saying we've got to be rude or crude or whatever, but we got to know what we believe and why we believe it. And we must be ready to take a stand and know. And I, I know in this community especially, there's this real feel, a sense of, uh, we just want to just get along and we just, you know, just kind of, we just, just kind of brush it over and whatever. And, and I understand there's, there's unity amongst believers and there's some things amongst believers that, okay, yeah, you, you kind of see that doctrine that way. We kind of see it this way. Okay, we can roll. Okay. But when it comes to um, absolutes, there's no debate like something like what I just mentioned. We, we've got to take a strong stance with each other as well as outside of the walls of faith, right? Uh, this is what Jesus is saying. I've come that, uh, to bring division, and, and aren't you glad you came today to hear that? Let's understand, it's going to happen, and it's sobering. That's a, let me use that word. It's sobering. It's not discouraging, but it's sobering to really contemplate, listen, what the cost of following Christ is. What that means is, is that when you take a stance at work, when you take a stance at school, when we take a stance on a on on a, a, a something biblical, a biblical stance in our culture, in our country, when you take a stance, there's going to be some people that aren't going to like you, and it's going to be your father, your mother, your sister-in-law. Your you you get what Jesus is saying here? You get this? It's going to be the person who you work with, and we as followers of Christ have to be ready, and have to be prepared. Because we don't want to be just enough saved. I just got my foot in the water enough. You know, it's kind of like when, I, when you're a little, little kid. Not that I ever did this, but you draw the bath. And the last thing you want to do, I want to do is take a bath. And so I, I, I would be lying to you if I wasn't honest to say that might have been a few times where I just kind of put my foot in and splashed around a little bit. So if mom asks, did you get in the water? Yeah, I got in the water, just my foot. <laughs> And I just, you know, I just kind of get your foot in the water. And I got my foot in the water enough so that I could honestly say to mom, yes, I got in the water. My foot got in the water. Some of you, that's the way your Christianity is. You're just like, and I'm just, uh, my foot's in the water. Oh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is good. And so then I can have the appearance of spirituality, um, but I also can be okay with those that aren't, and they still like me. My, my goal is not that people like me. I, ultimately, I want people to like me, but my goal is to serve Jesus and to put him first and be a light to the hurting in the, in the dark world, right? I mean, and so Jesus says, you, if you're going to let your light shine, there's going to be division. We don't, we don't want to be like the church of Laodicea. Do you remember them? Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot or neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus doesn't want you to be uh, uh, um, cold. He doesn't want you to be lukewarm. In fact, he wants you to be hot for him. So how can I do that? Just real quick, let me fly through these. I think it's in your notes. Uh, you, if you don't go home filling in every blank or whatever, you're going to be uh, struggling. So let me just say it. Um, how can I stay strong? Just real quick, these are no-brainers. You know this community, 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 not necessarily Middlebury, Goshen, Elkhart, 
uh, South Bend or wherever you hail from. I'm talking like biblical community, Acts 2.42, right? They were committed uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the fellowship community one another. You know, every time I'm a, I'm a grill guy, I like uh, the Weber grill, charcoal, briquette, none of this gas stuff. I mean, Jesus didn't, he didn't cook with gas. Come on. Jesus, natural gas grills, no. Jesus, well, I don't know that for sure, but I'm just guessing. Because I, if I know Jesus like I think I know him, he was a briquette type guy, charcoal briquettes. And you get those briquettes going and woo I mean, they just like feed off of one another. So, oh, are you red hot? I'm red hot. Are you? Re- I'm now red hot. And, and I'm turning from the black and to the grayish ashen red hot. Woo! But you take one of those even that are red hot, do it next time you're cooking the, the way Jesus did. Pull it, pull it off the fire and set it on the other side of the grill or even on the ground or whatever. And what's going to happen? That briquette goes out, right? I mean, it's slow. But all these others are still hot. And, and that's, that's a great example. We need community. We need each other. We need, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here on a Sunday morning, but I'm just telling you. How can I stay red hot? How can I make sure I don't fall asleep? How can I stay strong in my faith? Stay connected in community. Scripture, Scripture. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Scripture. And to prayer. Third thing, prayer. Worship. Um, worship. Let it be a lifestyle, not just a Sunday morning thing we do for a half an hour. Five, giving. Giving. Bringing your, where your treasures or your heart will be also. Giving. Um, not just your tithe and your offerings, even over and above that. Give of yourself, your time, talent, and treasure. Serving, serving one another, serving outside. We like to say here, serve here, serve there. Serve here in the local church, but serve out there where there's lost people, where people that don't know Christ yet, and remember what it's like, which really is number seven, evangelism. Do you remember what it was like before you got saved? Before you experiencing the, experienced the freedom we have in Christ? Do you remember that? Spend some time sharing Christ with others, living out your faith, building relationships. That's, Jesus said there's gonna be division. You gotta stay red hot. Let's keep going. Second thing I wanna talk to you about is not just division, but urgency. Look at verse 54. He said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately say, uh, it's gonna rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, uh, it's gonna be hot, and it is. Verse 56, hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Why did Jesus all of a sudden go whole Mike Hoffman on us here, you know? Maybe you don't watch that channel. He's a news guy, um, one of my favorites. But anyhow, um, why why did Jesus start talking about what... Uh, understand, up until this point, um, what was the main um, thing that people did in their, they were farmers, right? It was agricultural. And so Jesus is saying, isn't this amazing? You know how to tell what, what the weather's going to be like and, and how it's going to affect your crop. You, can, you got all that figured out. The people knew that clouds forming in the west over the Mediterranean Sea would bring rain Wind blowing in from the desert to the south would bring hot weather. And so people interpreted these signs and said, whoa, that's something else. And and Jesus is like, you got all that figured out, and you don't even have an app on your phone. I mean, well, he didn't say that, but I mean, that's really, that was, this is amazing, you guys know. And so Jesus is saying, that's so important to you that you got that figured out, but you don't even have what's really happening right in front of your face here. The kingdom of God is here through me, in me, Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. I am here. I am right here amongst you. Well, you can't even see what, what's going on right here in front of your face. There's no sense of urgency about spiritual matters. Jesus was announcing an earth-shaking event that would be much more important than the year's crops. The coming of God's kingdom here on earth. But they didn't get it. And what Jesus says is some of us are almost obsessively interested in weather, in anticipation and preparation for our future, and we don't even get ready for eternity. And he's like, are you going to heaven or hell? I don't know, but it's supposed to be 37 today. I mean, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Is there a, and so I'm going to toss this out to you in me. 
Is there a sense of urgency about your faith? Is there a sense of urgency to make sure you are praying and doing everything you can to lead your children to follow Christ? Man, we had a, a tremendous discussion. Most of you know the past couple months, Megan and I um, have been leading the youth staff on Wednesday nights um, to, in, in uh, our youth service. And in our high school group this past Wednesday night, man, it was just powerful. I think it's powerful. Just, do you know, for months now, let me tell you what your kids have been doing. They've been sitting in a circle for about a half hour, 45 minutes, Bibles open, reading scripture together, sometimes out loud, pulling out stuff from the word of God. And this is how we apply it to our, I'm, I'm telling you, God's doing some really cool things right now in our student ministries. And if you have a student who's in middle school or high school, I encourage you to do everything you possibly can to get them there on Wednesday nights. Bring them into that atmosphere so we can have the opportunity to disciple them and help lead them in the Acts 2.42 where they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to the, the teaching and, and the scripture, to prayer, to the fellowship and the, and the breaking of bread, Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Let me just ask you, is there an urgency though? Is there an urgency about you, mom and dad, to get your kids to embrace faith and not just any faith, but the Christian faith, the faith that you have and hold so dearly? Is there an urgency in your life that, I mean, you, you would talk to your kids or talk to your spouse or talk to your parents or talk to others just so flippantly around the water cooler at work or whatever it may be. You talk about all kinds of things, but is there an urgency? As, as I, I, I was just watching something this week. I was like, oh, God, help me, because I'm telling you, sometimes this, I, I, there's not an urgency in my heart, and there should be. I'm just being honest with you. But as a church, do we have an urgency to see God's will done in our lives and see people come to know Christ because you're going to stand before God one day. In fact, this is, this is what um, verse 57, look at it, look at it real quick. Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you're going with your adversary to the magistrate, uh, try hard to be reconciled to him on the way. Or he may drag you off to the judge and the judge turn you over to the officer and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you'll not get out until you have paid the last penny. What Jesus is saying is if you're going to get prepared for the weather, get prepared for judgment. Whether it's hot or cold tomorrow is not nearly as significant as whether or not I'm going to go to heaven or hell in eternity. So get ready for that day in court, that day when you stand before God, and we're all going to give account for our lives before the Lord. And he uses an interesting parable, an analogy here about, let me just Real quickly, just say, this is what it would be like. Let's say you, you committed a crime. Man, it was a big crime. It was, I mean, it was, you're going to go away for a life crime. You're going to get a life sentence, and you're going to spend the rest of your life probably in prison, no hope of parole. And this is sinking in. You haven't gone before the final sentencing, but your attorney says, hey, listen, you're, I don't know what you were thinking, you knucklehead. You, you never should have done this. I mean, I'm your attorney, and I'm going to do everything I can, but I'm just telling you. You're going to lose. You're going to go to prison for the rest of your life. That's just the way it's going to be. And then what if out of nowhere, the person who was, was pressing the charges or whatever just wrote you a letter and said, Dear Georgie, or whatever your name may be, um, I just want you to know, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this. I just wonder if we could spend some time together in the next couple of days. I'd like to befriend you. I'd like to get to know you. Um, I've had a bit of a change of heart, and here's the deal. I, I want to pull all the charges off of you. I'm not going to charge you at all. I'd like to spend some time with you, though, get to know you, and I'd like to, you know, I, I, but I don't want you to spend the rest of your life in prison. And how would that make you feel? And so Jesus is trying to correlate this story. You see, because you and I would be like, are you kidding me? I'm getting my life back? My, uh, the, the one who's brought these charges against me is becoming my friend, and they're going to cancel all my debts. They're going to give me a whole new life. And, you know, that's exactly what the Word of God is. Jesus' is, is, uh, analogy here is, 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 let me tell you something, it's, it's, it's the Bible is that letter, and he's handing us the letter saying, you know what, you don't deserve this. You committed the crime. You, you've all uh, been sinners, and you're all sinners but Jesus sends us his love letter in the word of God and says, but you're forgiven. 
And it doesn't make sense because we don't deserve that kind of grace and that forgiveness, but he does that. And Jesus is saying, listen, uh, I'm here. I'm going to bring division. And I wish the fire of God was already here. I'm going to bring division. But I want you I want you to have a sense of urgency about this. I want you not just to think about the weather and, and, and something he's getting ready to introduce here is, is a, a little bit news-oriented. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. But I want you, I want you, it's okay if you think about this stuff, but the urgent matter is your soul. There ought to be an urgency about your life and about your eternity. Don't waste any more time. Let's, let's talk about this. Talk to me before you're standing before the judge on that day of eternal sentencing. Jesus here is compelling you towards a sense of urgency. And some of us, if we were honest, we'd say, you know, I don't really... I don't really have much urgency in my faith. You're messing around with God. You're playing around with God. Occasionally dropping into church or praying a little bit or reading the Bible. And truthfully, you haven't really settled anything in with Jesus. You're not really prepared to stand before the judge. Your accounts are not cleaned out. You're not really confessed your sin and repented of your sin and given it to Jesus and trusted him by faith and worked on that reconciled relationship with him. And what would Jesus say to you today? What would we say to you today? Is this, don't delay. The time is short. Your life is just a vapor. It could be gone like that. Are you ready? And if you're not, you can be ready today. Put your hope, your faith in Christ. Receive him today. Unmerited. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. So we put our faith in him and receive freely by grace what he's done. Which really leads us to that third and final point, And that's just, just repentance. Repentance. Division. It's going to happen. It ought to happen. We, we are set apart. We're a holy people, right? Urgency. An urgency for what? A passionate urgency for what? Here it is. Repentance. Look at verse 1 of chapter 13. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Ooh, interesting. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, No. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Are those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Quick context here. There's this dude named Pilate. He had a contingency of soldiers. And his main duty was to keep the peace that ancient Rome imposed on all of its conquered territories. And there's no other historical document that talks about what verse 1 talks about here. But apparently, there were some of these uh, uh, Galileans, they were murdered at Pilate's orders. And uh, this would be completely in character with the way we see Pilate even at the end of Jesus' life. And so some of these people died tragically, and, and some left behind come to Jesus with this question, Why did this happen? Well, it must be because, this is their automatic thought, it must be because they were bad people. What does Jesus say? Verse 2. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. Let's keep going. He talks about Siloam. Siloam was an area in the southern part of the lower, uh, lower city of Jerusalem. It was a well-known pool. And evidently, at some point when they were doing a construction project, what happened? Things fell over, and there was many people that died. Um, I tell you no, but unless, uh, verse 4, or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Again, were, were, were these people bad people? Is that why this happened to them? Were they sinners? A Jewish thought up until this point would be if, if uh, for instance, um, if your child was born with an, uh, some kind of a, something that was uh, wrong physically, they were blind, they couldn't see, they couldn't walk, something like that, it'd be, well, you must have committed sin somewhere. I mean, that's, that's the way that they would think, the, the thought process. And Jesus is confronting this. Jesus is saying, not so. That, 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 that couldn't be further from the truth. The biggest thing that you need to understand is this, repent. 
Don't sit around debating of what sin did they do? What sin did they do? I mean, just think about it for a second. Think about it. There was these people that came in probably for worship. They're, they're, they're worshiping. There's, um, they went through all the ritualistic parts that the, 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 the law says you got to go through. And they're worshiping. And, and um, uh, Pilate steps in and massacres them all. Were they bad people? My guess is no, because they were there worshiping. I mean, you think about these um, people that were at the pool of Siloam. In Siloam, they were, they were there, and, and the 18 people that Jesus talks about, this tower came down on whatever it looked like. Were they bad people? I mean, imagine, uh, let's go back 16, 17 years, when we were building this sanctuary. We were building that section over there in the foyer and all this area. We did it all ourselves. Well, the majority of it we did ourselves. When I say ourselves, I'm like, the guys and gals part of this church. We put this church up originally, this original part. And imagine if all of us came out here 16 years ago. We're all out here. We got our tool belts on and we got our hammers. And mine wasn't as wore out as everybody else's, but I had mine on. And we're walking around. We're taking care of things. And, and I'm learning all kinds of things because I didn't know much about building, but I do now. But here's the deal. So, and then all of a sudden, what happens? We have some freak, tragic thing, and this back wall comes and crashes down on about 10 people. Are we going to stand around and say, wonder what they did to deserve that? (sighs) Let's get back to work, fellas. Of course we're not. Uh, Because that's not not the way God works. One of the things that you'll see in scriptures is good things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people. And there's this whole idea of karma. I don't, I don't agree with it. And I, I think we should steer away, even using it in, in, your, in your speech. I just encourage you with that. Uh, karma teaches that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Um, and, and there are some who would, who would stand up and say, well, this is judgment on those people. This is what happened here. That's, that's just God's judgment on those 18. That's just God's judgment on those Galileans because they deserve that. No, 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 no. That's not the way God works. So um, Jesus is saying, don't be so caught up in the latest Fox News headline that you miss what's most important. Repent! That's the most important thing. Don't be so caught up in, in what the weather's going to be like. Or, or, hey, we just heard the Galileans. They, a bunch of them died. Hey, well, what about these 18? That don't be so caught up in the weather, the news headlines, whatever it may be, that you, you miss some of the most important things. He, he's going back to the whole thought process of earlier on in, in, in verse uh, uh, 54. It's like you, you guys are all caught up in the weather, but you're missing the most important thing. I'm talking eternity here. I've come to bring division, Jesus says. I've come to bring division and divide families according to truth. I've I've come, and I hope you have an urgency here, an urgency to repent. What does real repentance look like? Let me hit that as we conclude. Real repentance looks like this. It starts with confession. Confession. Confession, it's, it's an agreeing with God. What you previously did not consider to be sin, as you read the Word of God, you realize it is sin, and you confess it. You're right. I'm wrong, God. That is unacceptable, and I need to die to that. It's the mind-changing thing. It's Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, because the patterns of the world say that sin, that um, uh, 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 sensuality, or whatever sin it is, that's normal. It's no big deal. It's just the way men are. It's just the way women are. That's what the world would say. But God says, no, that's sin. That's wrong. We need to renew our minds about that. No longer the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Let God renew our minds. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, perfect, and pleasing will. You, what? Renew your mind. Some of you need to read more Bible and a little less culture and agree with God that the way you're thinking is unacceptable. It's inexcusable. It's intolerable. We can't. We can't take in all of the, 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 the yuck of the world and, and um, not expect it to try to infiltrate our minds and our thinking. We've got to allow God to renew our minds. 
and it leads to your mouth. Out of your mouth comes words like, I'm sorry, I'm confessing, I'm wrong. It was evil. It's not your fault. There's no excuse. I have no one to blame but myself. I stole. I cheated. I sinned. Me, me, me. I did that. I confess my sins. True repentance is coming clean, saying, I did that. Second is contrition. It's a big word. An easier word that might be more uh, um, knowledgeable to many of us is remorse. But contrition, I'm remorseful. This, this is um, how many of you will, will acknowledge your sin, but you don't really seem bothered by it. I mean, have you ever struggled with that yourself? Have you ever seen someone else who's like, are you not, are you not like frustrated about this sin at all? I mean, it just seems like you're just going on. It's, no, there's a, there's a deep, and I think this really takes time. I'm convinced it takes time to set in. The truth is that if you don't seem troubled by it and destroyed by it and devastated and disturbed by it, people wonder if you really mean it when you confess it. Why well, confessed it? Why can't people just trust that I'm sorry? Okay, we'll trust, but let's see some fruit. Let's see let's see some fruit of remorse. Let's see some let's see some surreal wrestling. Some humility coming out of that. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Where does it start? It starts with confessing your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive everyone. It's contrition. It's being remorseful for my sins. But the third thing that we've got to do under the power of the Holy Spirit is to change. This is a change of of, of a will and of works and of actions. You want to stop? You want to change? You want to learn? You want to grow? You want to be different? You want the future to not look like your past. You don't want to go back. By the grace of God, you want to keep going in a new direction of life with Jesus. And this leads to new works. You work to make godly friends. You work to read the Bible, be humble, be repentant. And you allow God to change your heart, change your actions. Repentance is confessing your sins, confessing your wrong. It's contrition. It's being remorseful for that. And then it's change. Now is your opportunity to repent. It's the mind, the emotions, the actions. So let me hit these three areas as we conclude. Division. Let me just ask, let me ask you a question here. Bible's shut. Preacher's done. Here it is. Response now. Would there be enough, if you, were, if you were held in, if you're in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? I mean, if you were in a, I'm not saying you ever would be, but if you were in a court of law and they were trying to prove, oh yeah, this person is a Christian and he's going to be found guilty as a Christian because would there be enough evidence? Or do we look just like the world? And by that, people who are unrepentant, people who have no faith. Are, are we trying so hard to be like them so that we can be with, that we're losing our distinctiveness and our holiness and, our, and the purity that God desires us to have and, and to be? There, there needs to be a healthy division there. So do you need to work on that? How many, if you were honest, you'd say, Scott, I know sometimes I give in. And there's even pastors and there's even churches that at times have gone too far in this. I mean, they've led their churches um, into uh, uh, how can you ever um, win someone to Christ if you're not around them? But the challenge is if if you're around people that don't know Christ and follow Christ all the time, it's going to affect you. So... Um, there's got to be a balance here, and, and we've all got to got to build on that. But understand, even when Jesus was in the midst of sinners at the party with Matthew, the tax collector, right? Jesus was still Jesus. He was still holy. He was still righteous. And, and when you see Jesus spending time with unbelievers, it wasn't all the time. Who did he spend most of his time with? He spent most of his time with other believers, the disciples, pouring into them, Right? Yes, Jesus spent time with unbelievers. What, what, what are you saying, Scott? Well, what I'm saying, are, are, you, are, are you on fire? Is, is your light, are, do you ever stick out like a sore thumb? Because if so, I think we're on the right track. What about this? Is there an urgency? 
Is there an urgency in your faith? Or are you messing around? Have you talked with your spouse about your faith? Have you talked with your kids about your faith? Is there an urgency to live for and follow Jesus and share your faith? I saw this this past week. I thought, man, this is good. Pastor Sam Reifkogel, he's a pastor, uh, I think it's First Assembly in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We can't expect full-time benefits from Jesus when we're living a part-time Christianity. Ooh, man, I thought that was good. Is there an urgency about your faith? Is there an urgency to be living out your faith and to be sharing your faith? Is there an urgency that, whoa, what if Jesus is about to come back? Am I ready? Have I done everything to lead others as well? How about this one, repentance. Have you experienced confession, contrition, and change? Have you experienced that? If not, this is your day today. I want to spend some time in prayer. Would you stand with me? Worship team, would you come? And would you reverently just put your stuff aside for a few moments and let's just respond in prayer right now. Just close your eyes. Close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to contemplate your own life. I want you to begin to search your own heart right now. How's it going in the area of division? I mean, in your desire to, to even, even to build a relationship, to try to share Christ with people, have maybe you gone too far? Have you lost your saltiness? If we could use the, uh, the analogy in Scripture. Is your light shining bright for Christ? Would there be enough if you were in a court of law and you were put on trial, would there be enough proof to convict you of being a Christian? I'm just going to ask right now, with no one looking around, um, no one looking around, just between you and the Lord right now, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a second. If you say, yeah, division. I, I, need, to, I, I need to work on this. I, I know that sometimes I give in to the jokes at work. I give in to the conversations. I, I might be just as uh, given to, uh, to gossip or to slander. I, I know that sometimes I... I'm not as salty. I'm not as uh, I'm not full of light like I should be. I there's I, I know I don't stick out. Sometimes I just blend in and I hide my faith just because I don't want to shake things up. But I know that Christianity in itself it's inherent. I, we're here to shake things up. We're here like Jesus to confront. You say, Scott, I need prayer because I need to be more confrontational in a loving way, but I need to be more confrontational. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand? No one looking around. I'm going to pray for you in a second. I need to be more confrontational. I need my light to be, to, to be brighter. Thank you. Wow, hands up all over the room. I know what you're saying. Okay, put those hands down. Urgency, Scott. As soon as you started talking about urgency... I just, I, I was so convicted. The moment you said the word, Scott, the moment you kept talking about the urgency of our faith, the urgency of dealing with it right now, we can talk about the weather, we can talk about the news, but the urgency of making sure I'm ready and I, that I'm sharing Christ with others, there's just, I don't have that, that the urgency that I need to have. Scott, would you pray for me? If that's you, no one looking around, just raise your hand. I, wanna, I, want, I need a renewed urgency today, Scott. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And the last one is, is one of repentance. Again, I'm going to ask nobody looking around, but you'd be like, Scott, I've come to this church for a while, or I've been to church for many years, or, but I'm not sure I've ever really understood what it means to repent. The whole idea of confessing my sins without, uh, without any buts. The whole idea of confessing my sins and not blaming anything on anyone else, but taking complete ownership of my sins. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the whole idea of contrition. The whole idea of, of being remorseful. And I'm sorry for that. I didn't understand how important that was. And I want to change. I don't want to just add Jesus to my life. And, and so this last one is just repentance. You need to repent of your sins and get your life right with Christ. I don't care if this is your first time you've ever attended here. I don't care if you've attended here for 15 years. You say, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to repent right now, right here. Would you just raise your hand? No one looking around right now. 